So my pleasure to welcome today uh, Enrique Vasquez Semedini. Uh, Enrique is coming to us from the UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, the branch in Morelia, uh, where he is a director of the uh, of their research institute at Morelia. And uh, Enrique has been a leading researcher in the study of uh, turbulence, gravity, and and uh, physical processes that lead to star formation in uh, nearby uh, giant molecular clouds. Uh, he's come at the problem from the viewpoint of numerical simulations. <coughs> he started uh, his career uh, with a PhD from uh, UT, University of Texas in Austin, studying with John Scalo. And then he went to uh, work at UNAM uh, shortly after that. That was in uh, 1991. Uh, and I recently learned that UNAM uh, is the oldest university in North America, 65 years older than Harvard. <laughs> Things you can learn on That's Wikipedia. Really <laughs> uh, and he has been associated with UNAM ever since, uh, first in Mexico City and then in their more recently established branch in Morelia, which is about uh, 60 miles to the west. So he's had a very active career studying the interplay between uh, turbulence and gravity and how they uh, do or do not lead to star formation uh, in molecular clouds. And today his uh, title will be, the short title is uh, Hierarchical Gravitational Fragmentation. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to, to be here. Uh, I have very good old friends and it's a real, ex uh, really, uh, exciting opportunity to tell you guys about uh, the, the work we have been doing in the last several years. So this is going to be more or less a panoramic view of, of the work we've done. Uh, part of it is based on what I discussed in the ITC this morning on why uh, we decided on the basis of numerical simulations that probably turbulence is not as relevant for the formation of stars as we used to think and after all, gravity is one uh, is the dominant uh, physical process. So that's uh, uh, the origin of uh, the title here: is hierarchical gravitational fragmentation. And the subtitle: it, uh, This uh, scenario attempts to give a unified view for the uh, for the structure, evolution, and star formation activity of molecular clouds. So this is this is uh, the the main topic. Uh, but here I should be careful to specify that I'm going to be discussing star-forming molecular clouds. That is, there may be a whole uh, family of clouds that is actually not on, their way to, not on their way to forming stars, but actually on their way from f having formed stars and now being uh, in the process of dispersal. That's probably what is going to keep me busy for the next few years. But for now, it, uh, I'm going to discuss mostly the stages that lead from the formation to the star formation, uh, uh, star forming active stages of molecular clouds. This is a list of my collaborators. Uh, it's a long list. Most of them are, are at UNAM. Uh, some of them are my students and postdocs, and, and also uh, Robbie Banerjee, Jan Forbridge, and Ralph Klesen have uh, collaborated with us uh, over over the years. And so I, I want to cover all of these topics. And of course, this is a very ambitious list. Uh, if I I hope I can make it to uh, a good grade and, uh, in going up to these numbers. But uh, so I want to start with a bit of history, then talk, mention just some evidence, some of which has been produced by many of my colleagues here, uh, about uh, suggesting a return to a global collapsing view for molecular clouds. Then I want to get into the physics. Why are we thinking that clouds can be collapsing? And then discuss the mechanism of uh, hierarchical fragmentation. And then a bunch of consequences uh, f going from the structure of molecular clouds to, the, uh, to their star formation activity. So let me start with a little bit of history. And this goes back mostly to uh, the mid-70s, shortly after molecular lines had been, had been discovered. And uh, they had been discovered to have supersonic line widths. And shortly after the discovery of those supersonic line widths, uh, there were 
there was a, a group of uh, workers that interpreted those supersonic motions, non-thermal motions, as infocal, as info, as gravitational collapse. Uh, there was some observational evidence. I won't uh, get into the details of, of, of these reasonings because uh, time will not allow. But this, there were conclusions that clouds could be gravitationally contracting both from the observational side and from the theoretical side. And this paper here emphasized mostly that if the clouds were turbulent, the turbulence should dissipate quickly and they would lose the turbulent support. And also that molecular clouds were observed to have masses much larger than their genes mass and therefore they should collapse. But on the other hand, there was a, a community saying, no, they can't be collapsing. <coughs> And, and those works were mostly led by Zuckerman. Uh, Zuckerman and Palmer in, in an annual reviews pointed out that if clouds were to be collapsing on the freefall time scale, then a freefall estimate of the star formation rate would give a number uh, which, which you would do just as basically taking the total molecular mass in the galaxy divided by its corresponding freefall time, and you, will, you would get a number on the order of 300 solar masses per, uh, per year, which is about 100 times what is observed. So uh, there was uh, uh, this, this contradiction has become known by some of us as the star formation conundrum, the star formation rate conundrum. On the other hand, Zuckerman and Evans, also in 1974, so all of this you, you see happened in 1974. Uh, the Zuckerman and Emmons pointed out that if the clouds were to be collapsing or in general suffering large-scale radial motions, then one should observe systematic shifts between the absorption lines produced in the envelopes of the clouds and the emission lines produced in the central objects of the clouds, which were not observed at the time. And so they concluded that, uh, no, the clouds couldn't be collapsing and in general, they couldn't be undergoing large-scale systematic uh, radial motions. And so Zuckerman and Evans in particular suggested that instead the supersonic line width uh, must have consisted of small-scale turbulent motions rather than large-scale radial motions. And therefore, the idea of collapse, of the global collapse of molecular clouds uh, slowly was dismissed. Mm -hmm. Not only that, also came, uh, well, if, uh, Maybe some, if several years after that came what uh, became a paradigm of molecular clouds, which is Larson's relations. Uh, Larson in 1981 noticed uh, from collecting a, a sample of clouds from different observations that uh, of molecular clouds, these are uh, in general molecular clouds observed in 12CO, that the velocity dispersion of those clouds scaled, uh, he found an exponent close to 0.4, the current value, the most accepted value is like 0.5, so that the velocity dispersion scaled as the size to the one-half power. And he also noticed that uh, the mean density of the clouds seemed to scale essentially inversely with the size of the clouds. And in particular, this last relationship implies that the column density, which to order of magnitude is just the product of the density times the scale size, was, should be constant. And so, these became known as the Larson's relations, and some people call them the Larson laws. Uh, together, they, in, in fact, imply approximate virial equilibrium. So if you combine the two relationships, you find that uh, then this ratio here should be constant, and that is exactly what you obtain when you equate the kinetic energy to the gravitational energy. And that also was observed by Larson. Uh, so the conclusion was that these two relations were actually a manifestation of burial equilibrium in the clouds. However, already in the 90s, in, uh, in the late 80s and the 90s, there were criticisms or concerns about this. In particular, uh, John Scalo in 1990 pointed out that the apparent uh, constancy of the column density could have been just a selection effect due to limited dynamic range in, in the observations. And so that was a possibility. And, not on, and this, in fact, has come to be verified. Uh, more recent observations, uh, for example, by Mark Heyer and company, uh, using 13CO, uh, which, is, which has a larger dynamic range in, in column density, immediately showed that, you, uh, that the column densities of a whole sample of molecular clouds spanned over two orders of magnitude. And therefore, 
uh, this means that since the column density is not constant, that the density size relationship is not valid in general. But instead, he showed that what seems to hold is that the, the velocity dispersion divided by size to the one half power scales like the one half, half power of the column density. And that is the generalization of virial equilibrium, of this simple form of virial equilibrium, when the column density is allowed to vary. Then you expect this instead of, of a, a constant value of this ratio. So that would be the generalization of Larson's relationships, uh, still assuming virial equilibrium, but relaxing the condition that the, that the density scales like the inverse of the size scale. But moreover, uh, it had been known already that massive clumps do not seem to follow the Larson uh, uh, line with size relation. So for example, here is the Larson sample of molecular clouds. Here is the Heyer sample of molecular clouds. But these others are uh, samples of massive star-forming clumps. And they seem to, be, to deviate from, uh, from the Larson line with size relationship. We noted, noted that in this paper in, with, by Javier Ballesteros Paredes in 2011, who was, by the way, a pre-doc here. And, um, but what he, we showed in this paper is that the, the massive clumps do follow the same uh, scaling relation as the molecular clouds. So not only the GMCs span a range in column densities, also if you take uh, massive forming cores, massive star forming cores, uh, which do not conform to the Larson line with size relation, they do, however, conform to the uh, virial, to the general idea of virial equilibrium. Except that in that paper, we also noticed that this is also consistent with gravitational infall. Because after all, the virial equilibrium velocity and the infall velocity are, uh, differ only by a factor of square root of two, which is completely within the noise of, of, this, of these data. So in any case, we like to think that these uh, velocities are generated by, uh, by gravity somehow. So, uh, in, in this paper, then, we suggested that, uh, the, that these velocities are the consequence of gravity rather than some form of, tur form of turbulence that is opposing the gravity. Now, uh, since, uh, since the year 2010 or so, uh, there have been a number of papers that have been push uh, observational papers that have more or less reinforced the idea that there's collapse at many different scales in molecular clouds. So, for example, this is a paper where, in which Eric Kido and Chiju uh, Zhang participated and um, uh, indicating hierarchical accretion from the scales of, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, of 0.01 parsecs to point, point, uh, several tenths of parsec. So at least more than an order of magnitude in scales showing evidence for info. Uh, there has been evidence of uh, infall across along filaments into central hubs, and I'll get to that in, uh, in a minute, uh, also by, uh, by Phil Myers and co-workers, and so on. And there is this recent paper by Alvaro Akar and Joao Alves uh, suggesting that the entire OMC re one region in the Orion molecular cloud is undergoing gravitational <laughs> contraction. And this is already at the scale of several parsecs. So there seem to be indications that there's gravitationally contra gravitational contraction motions on over a wide range of scales, not just at the scale of molecular cloud cores, which what used to be the idea that, uh, that was dominating, dominating until you know, uh, perhaps this, this time. So how, how does the mechanism work of hierarchical gravitational fragmentation? Well, for that, we would like to think about how clouds form in, the, in particular. Uh, like I uh, discussed earlier on this morning uh, during the lunch, the ITC lunch, um, we started noticing some discrepancies between different works uh, looking at what the effect of the turbulent velocity dispersion was on the star formation efficiency. My group, for example, had been doing numerical simulations of uh, driven turbulence and we investigated how increasing the Mach number of the turbulence would uh, control the star formation rate, and we found that the star formation efficiency uh, 
would decrease with increasing Mach number. Yet people doing simulations of decaying turbulence, so just give, give your numerical box an initial turbulent kick and, and let the turbulence decay, they were finding the opposite result. They found that larger Mach numbers increased the star formation efficiency. So that led me to, to ask the question, well, so what do we do? Uh, we need to know what is the, the real source of turbulence in molecular clouds and whether it is driven or decaying or what. So for that, I was lucky enough to witness a talk uh, by Rolf Walder, uh, a Swiss uh, numericist, where he indicated, where he showed that when you do simulations of colliding gas, streams of gas, then the, uh, the compressed layers uh, became strongly turbulent. And, uh, but converging streams of gas is exactly what you need for forming density fluctuations. The continuity equation of fluid dynamics tells you that in order to increase the density at a certain location in a certain point in space, you need the velocity field to be convergent in, in that point. That is, you need to have a negative divergence of the velocity. And therefore, dense cold clouds must form by converging flows. And given the talk by this, uh, by this person, um, so uh, noticing that this mechanism on top of forming the clouds gave us uh, turbulent clouds, then I thought, oh, maybe that's a source of, of turbulence. And so we started doing colliding flow simulations. And this is one such simulation, uh, which I showed also this morning. Um, basically, what you, what you see is that there's uh, two streams of gas colliding. Now, this is supposed to be the warm neutral medium in a box of about 250 parsecs on the side. And so warm neutral medium means a, a density of about one particle per cubic centimeter, temperatures of about 5,000 kelvins. But the collision, uh, it had also been shown by other workers like Patrick Nebel and Inutsuka san in Japan, that um, those collisions would trigger thermal instability so that the compressed layer would be a, a layer of cold, dense gas. So it would be what we call the uh, the cold neutral medium. So we had a mechanism that created cold gas, turbulent cold gas, out of just the assembly of uh, just collisions of streams in the warm neutral medium. Now this is a more recent simulation. The other one was from 2007. We published this one in 2014. Uh, this is the same but not now seen uh, face on. So now the streams are colliding uh, perpendicularly to the, to the screen. And you see that uh, the cloud forming, uh, some, of, some fragments are getting dispersed, but you see that the bulk of the cloud, even though it is turbulent, begins to collapse. So the turbulent induced by the collision is not su sufficient to avoid the global collapse of the cloud. Mm -hmm. This simulation still has no stellar feedback and no magnetic fields. It's just uh, hydrodynamics and self-gravity. Mm -hmm. So why, why would these clouds collapse? Well, one thing that we should keep in mind, I mean, uh, we have known this for a long time, but uh, somehow it has been overlooked. If molecular clouds form out of a phase transition from the warm diffuse phase to the cold dense phase, they, the, then their density increases by a factor of about 100. The temperature drops by the same factor. And therefore, the genes mass drops by a factor of about 10 to the 4. So moreover, if uh, 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 this, so these temperatures in the CNM now are on the order of several tens of kelvins, and the densities are several tens of particles per cubic centimeter. Uh, now, if you go yet one more step to molecular gas with densities of several hundreds and temperatures of 10, then you can have an almost another hundred uh, fold factor in density uh, in, the, in the gas, and so your genes mass may increase by another factor of 10. <coughs> Because the temperature drop is not so much anymore, but the, but the density increase is still uh, significant, and so your genes mass can decrease yet another factor of 10. Bringing us from uh, genes masses in the warm neutral medium from a, of about a few times 10 to the 7 solar masses to a few times 10 to the 3 solar masses in the, in the cold atomic gas, and uh, maybe on the order of several hundreds of solar masses in the molecular gas. So uh, that suggests that this uh, cloud that is formed by condensation from the warm neutral medium quickly 
becomes gravitationally unstable. Now, when, now we know molecular clouds are roughly isothermal, and if we now uh, accept the idea that the clouds are contracting globally, then uh, Fred Hoyle, uh, oh, about 65 years ago, suggested that, or, or pointed out that, first, uh, for an isothermal gas, well, in general, the genes mass goes like temperature to the three halves times the density to the minus one half, which means that for isothermal flows, the, the genes mass goes like uh, the inverse half power of the density. And so when a, gene, when a cloud is, an isothermal cloud is contracting, the, it's, the mean genes mass in the cloud decreases. So as it contracts, it contains more and more genes masses. So, and, and he proposed that that would lead to fragmentation, and he worked out even uh, uh, the, the final expected masses if you assume that this, this process ends when the gas ceases to be isothermal. But uh, the mechanism was criticized by Tolin in 1980 because he pointed out that for spherical clouds, just above the genes mass, then you have, uh, and with linear density fluctuations, the fastest growing mode is the largest scale, which means that the collapse of the large scale overwhelms the collapse of the small scales and you have no time to fragment. And this sort of led to the idea that uh, Hoyle fragmentation doesn't work. And so we sort of began resorting to other things like turbulent fragmentation and, and so on, which is half the story I'm going to tell. Mm -hmm. So, but now what happens in real molecular clouds today? Well, we know they're not spherical. Uh, instead, they're probably sheet-like uh, because their formation precisely requires converging streams. Then they contain many genes masses precisely because of the mechanism I, I, I mentioned, which is the cooling. And if you are collecting gas from a large-scale flow in the galaxy, say, for example, into the, spiral, the stellar spiral arm, uh, then they quickly can acquire many genes masses. And then also they contain nonlinear turbulent density fluctuations. So uh, not necessarily the turbulence is strong enough to induce local collapses and to support the clouds, but it certainly gives you distribution of density fluctuations. For example, this is a, uh, a numerical simulation by Heitch and Hartmann in 2008, where they measured uh, the evolution of the distribution of freefall times in a cloud, in, in this cloud. So, for, uh, so here in this plot, this is the, the time axis, and here is plotted the freefall time, and the color bar indicates the amount of mass that is at each freefall time. So you see that you have a distribution of masses at different uh, values of the freefall time. That is, the main role of the turbulence is to give you a distribution of density fluctuations, which in turn gives you a distribution of freefall times in the cloud. So this is the picture, the schematic picture, that represents what we saw in, in the simulation. We get gravitational contraction, which starts at the largest scale. And then as it contracts, smaller scales begin to become gravitationally unstable. And the more the cloud has contracted, the smaller the genes mass is, and therefore, the smaller the masses that can go locally into collapse. Because the, because the, fl the fluctuations are nonlinear, those fluctuations have shorter freefall times, and then they can finish their collapse before the, the large-scale collapse, which is what we saw in the simulation. You saw that many little points appeared, which were local, locally formed stars before the entire region collapsed. And uh, so, the, when, so this is more or less the picture that we have. Uh -huh. So we have obj a large-scale object. As it contracts, it be, uh, generates a, generation, a new generation of smaller-scale objects, objects that can go into collapse. And as they collapse, now later on, new objects become unstable and begin to collapse on their own. But at the same time, each, uh, each subfamily or sub-hierarchy is participating of the, on the large, of the large scale collapse. And this in the prescription would be a high mass star forming region. So how does this fare with observations? So now I go into the implications of the, of the scenario. So first, the, um, one, one thing I also mentioned uh, at lunchtime today is that the turbulence generated by the convergence of the streams is not sufficient 
to hold, to support the weight of the cloud. So once the cloud goes, G is unstable, it collapses. The turbulence, so this is a plot of velocity dispersion versus time in the cloud. And uh, the lines are velocity dispersions in the different directions. Uh, the solid line is the velocity dispersion in the same direction as the colliding flows. So that's contaminated by the inflows. But the, the other two lines, which here overlap, are the velocity dispersion in the, in the perpendicular direction. So you could say that this is the true velo tur turbulent velocity dispersion in the cloud. And in this simulation, it's seen that it is not very large. It's 0.5 kilometers per second, which, given the temperature of the gas, it's a Mach number of a few, two, two, three, something like that. And then, once the cloud reaches its genes mass, now it becomes genes unstable and begins to collapse. And then the velocity dispersion begins to increase. This is a much smaller velocity dispersion than we typically associate with... Uh, with molecular clouds. The typical values that we associate are these. So this suggests that the velocity dispersions that we observe in molecular clouds are the result of the gravitational collapse, not turbulence fighting or opposing the collapse. And this was an SPH simulation, so you could question it uh, because SPH schemes are known to be highly dissipative, but we've obtained the same type of results with doing AMR simulations in different uh, in other studies. <laughs> and uh, an interesting point is that star formation occurs even later. So the cloud has been contracting for five, seven million years before the first star appears. Mm -hmm. So now what happens in this scenario? So we have collapses at all scales. The, the smallest scale collapses appearing later, but finishing earlier than the whole cloud. So. Uh, my, my grad student, Vianney Camacho, uh, took, out, took one of these simulations and made a, a survey of the clumps in, in that, simula in that simu uh, simulation. And uh, so she plotted the clumps in the same diagram uh, by, that was uh, studied by Eric Kido and Phil Myers and Mark Heyer, velocity dispersion divided by size to the one half versus column density. So this is essentially a, uh, a diagram comparing kinetic energy versus gravitational energy. And what is seen is that the clouds, the clumps, so and the, our sample was defined by thresholding the density field at different values. And so we see that when, when the threshold is very low, we get a large scatter, and when we go to higher and, uh, higher, and higher density objects, the more they, uh, they appear here. Not only it has been observed in this type of simulations, uh, Ibanez Mejia et al. with Mordecai Maclow have shown in simulations driven by supernovae that the same type of, uh, of scaling occurs. Okay. So uh, this is something that uh, appears in the numerical simulations. But now, this is another simulation, one which was not based on colliding flows, but just on random turbulence in the, in the warm neutral medium. We did that just so to eliminate the possibility that we were being biased by uh, the colliding flow scenario. So this is another simulation. It shows the same pattern. It, it is more turbulent, as you can see. It has more velocity dispersion. But what's very interesting is that uh, it looks very similar to diagrams of, mole of clouds in nearby galaxies, for example, as compiled by Leroy and company. Uh, so this is a survey of clouds or a collection of data points from different uh, of clouds at the 100 parsec scale uh, in, in nearby galaxies. And uh, I swear to God that we didn't choose on purpose the color scheme to be the same. It was just pure luck. <laughs> okay. But so, what happens with these cores, with these clumps? So these are low column density clumps that have an excess of kinetic energy. Um, they have been there for a long time. Uh, Eric Kido and, uh, and George Field have looked at them. Uh, and sometimes they have been interpreted as perhaps being confined by external pressure. But what we did is we looked at them individually. And uh, in particular, th these were highly dynamic objects. And I had, uh, and so Vianney, what she did, was measure the mean velocity divergence in these clumps. And she found that in about half of them, it was 
positive and about half of them it was negative, which means about half of these clumps were, being in, the, were in the process of dispersal and half of these clumps were in the process of assembly, just like the converging flows. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that for about half of the objects in this region, uh, what you're observing here is the action of the converging flows assembling the clouds, which once they become gravitationally bound, then they evolve into higher densities, and then they become dominated by their gravitational motions. Mm -hmm. So these would be gravitationally driven velocities, and these would be inertial motions, half, about half of which would be uh, assembling the clouds. No thermal pressure confinement necessary in any case, because these clouds are not hydrostatic. They are not, uh, they're not in balance. They are moving. They are dynamic entities. Another, so just like we showed, like I showed that diagram, one can compute the virial parameter, which I'm sorry I forgot to define here, but this is essentially twice the kinetic energy divided by the gravitational energy, and it is customary to plot it against mass, and you see that, again, the, the signature that the low mass objects, in this case, the fluffiest objects, tend to have an excess of kinetic energy, and that matches quite well with observations, for example, uh, here this diagram from Jens' uh, paper from 2013, where you see the same trend. So you could interpret these low column density or low mass objects or low column density in, in the other diagram. Uh, so essentially the, the objects that are less, who, whose velocity, whose gravitational velocities are smallest, to then uh, be apparently dominated by by the inertial motions. But in about half of the cases, those inertial motions are working together with gravity or favoring gravity so that gravity will take over and lead to the gravitational collapse of these objects. In a more recent paper that uh, we published this year, we also uh, try to explain an, an observation which, uh, about which Jens has been, in particular, uh, and Chiju have been very interested uh, lately, which is some of the dense cores appear to be significantly subvirial. And how do you explain this? Well, for these dense cores, because they're dense, their gravitational velocities are dominant. They must be dominant compared to, to, the, uh, to the turbulent velocities. But what happens if you imagine this uh, fragmentation scenario where you have a large cloud and then it has density fluctuations which at the beginning are doing nothing, other than fluctuate, but uh, eventually the genes mass decreases, so I, I say that it catches down to the mass of the fragments, and then at some point they become unstable and begin to contract, to contract on their own. So you must imagine that these objects begin to contract gravitationally from a finite size. So there's a density fluctuation with a finite size and all of a sudden it begins to collapse. When, when you take that into account, you have an, an expression like this for the gravitationally driven velocity, where you have to subtract uh, a term that depends on the initial size of the, of the region. And, the, uh, and this line is this line. Mm -hmm. So it means not only that, the gravitational collapse is very slow at the beginning, so you should expect to see quite a number of these objects in which the velocity is not quite the freefall velocity because it's only catching up to the freefall value. Uh, so, uh, one thing that I, I still have pending to do is to actually, in this plot, quantify the time that, that a core spends in, in each region here. But I expect to spend more time here, to, to spend more time here than over there. And, uh, and although here, uh, in this sample that we collected, it seems like that's not the case. In other cases that I, I've seen, uh, in fact, um, somebody this morning was showing me that the majority, ah, yeah, Chishu, precisely. He was showing to me that the majority of the objects seem to be under burial and only a relatively small fraction, perhaps 20%, are, are seen to be uh, at, at the burial value. So that would be consistent with this. I'm not ruling out other mechanisms like m magnetic support of the cores, but this is one mechanism, evolutionary mechanism, that tells you that cores that have recently decoupled from the flow and began to collapse should follow a track like that. So no need for magnetic support, although oh, on, the, on the other hand, this is no proof that uh, magnetic uh, support is not acting there. So, but this is a, an alternate mechanism for keeping the cores there. <clears throat> 
Now, filament formation. There's another uh, important consequence of this, which is that if the clouds contain many, many genes masses, then uh, the, they behave essentially as if they were pressureless. And if they are pressureless, then we know since the 60s, uh, Professor Lin showed it uh, with, uh, with Frank Xu, uh, that the, the growth, the, the, the evolution of a collapsing object, a triaxial ellipsoid, amplifies anisotropies. It collapses fastest along the shortest axis. And so a triaxial ellipsoid evolves into a, a sheet-like object and that evolves into a filament. And that is exactly what we observe here. Right. So uh, let me play it again. So this is a zoom of the same simulation I showed you before. And so you can see how it's turbulent, okay, but not strongly turbulent. So gravity is dominating and it's forming the filament. And once the filaments form, then ultimately they begin to fall into whatever density fluctuation was present there that becomes dominant and then uh, gravitationally drags the rest of the material in. And come on. And this is another movie just showing you what is the velocity field in this, uh, in, in this simulation to show the fact that, uh, that the collapse is really proceeding uh, in the way uh, envisioned by, by Lin and collaborators. It collapses first to, here you see the velocity vectors pointing towards the filament, and then the velocity changes direction in the filament to fall into the, uh, into the central hub. And let me play it again, uh, just so that you see. Another important thing is that you see fragmentation in the filament uh, as it falls. So this is similar to what uh, uh, Steve Longmore has uh, called a conveyor belt mechanism. So you have a large-scale collapse consisting of a filamentary flow, and within it you have small-scale collapses. Mm -hmm. These filaments uh, look reasonably realistic. So, for example, in, in this paper, uh, we compared the, the radial profile, the average radial profile of the filament, uh, with, the, with that observed, and Okay, the, we did not do a survey, so we don't have statistics. The, these were just two filaments that we decided to study in the simulation. Uh, but we have uh, lengths of um, 10, 20 parsecs, central, uh, ce uh, central thicknesses or widths of the filaments of about a few tenths of a parsec, a, an exponent here on, on the order of two, two and a half, and that could be compared to the filaments observed by Arzumanian and company uh, in which the central radii, these are certainly smaller, but the profiles are more or less in the, so our profiles tend to be within this range. The lengths are more or less the same. The central column densities are similar. The, uh, the linear mass densities are also similar. So. Uh, for a simulation that was not designed to produce filaments. This was just another cloud formation simulation. We, we thought that the filaments were surprisingly resemblant of what is observed. Not only that, if you look at the position velocity diagram, at uh, two different kinds of position velocity diagrams in these filaments. Uh, you can have the typical velocity, position velocity diagram, so this would be the coordinate along the filament, and uh, <clears throat> And this is the, the, radio, the line of sight velocity uh, dispersion that, that you observe. And uh, so here the color indicates the, the column density. And, uh, and you see how the filament consists of two streams, one moving into the core, the other one also moving into the core, and then a large velocity dispersion at the center, which is where the gas shocks. and, uh, and becomes turbulent, but also uh, essentially you're transforming this longitudinal velocity dispersion in, uh, sorry, longitudinal velocity into velocity dispersion at the core, which becomes turbulent. But not only that, you also have uh, a plot of a different kind of position velocity plot. This is again a column density map, but here we are, this axis shows you the, the magnitude of the longitudinal velocity. And the longitudinal velocity is de depicted by this line. So you see that the, the gas is flowing here. The velocity is positive, so it's moving upwards uh, up, uh, up to this, approaching the central core. And here it's moving, it's negative, so it's moving downwards, approaching the core. It has a big jump, which gives you this uh, uh, 
large velocity dispersion in this region. Not only that, you see small scale copies of the same phenomenon at the sub clumps occurring here. So this is, at least over a range of scales, apparently a scale free process where you have filaments and then when the filament becomes uh, unstable or, how, or supercritical as, as it's something called, sometimes called, then it begins to fragment and when it does it develops these jumps in velocity. And so you see these little peaks. And this can be compared to what's observed in actual filaments. This is again from another paper from Akar. And, uh, and so you see how this, this is of course velocity dispersion along the line of sight. But, I uh, know, sorry, this is velocity, yeah, with, the, with respect to the local standard of rest. So, uh, this is more like a, uh, like a first moment map. But you see that uh, here we have one particular velocity, so the gas is moving in this direction. Here you have a different velocity, so that the gas is moving in this direction. And you have a growth uh, of, uh, in, in the velocity, just like here. So, again, this compares well to, to the filaments, although, uh, I think in order to say something conclusive, we need to do statistics, which, which we haven't done. Now, in the presence of the magnetic field, this has consequences, because if you assume that there's a magnetic field that is, uh, uh, that is subdominant, it is a, that is, that it's just being dragged by the, by the flow, so just the field is dragged, not controlling the flow, but then uh, what happens is the field should be, be, remember the velocity field that goes into the filament and then it bends. So you should expect the magnetic field to do something similar. But on the other hand, you cannot stretch the magnetic field indefinitely because the magnetic tension became, becomes larger and larger. So at some point, uh, magnetic diffusion of some kind, and we did not quantify what that is, should uh, compensate the, dra the, the ram pressure along of the flow along the filament as it's flowing down, uh, downwards. And so we produced uh, from our simulations uh, diagrams, uh, the Van Gogh type of diagrams that uh, the Planck people have uh, popularized. And this is, for example, what uh, the, uh, one of our filaments looks like. And the lines show you what is the, uh, what is the magnetic field orientation in the sky. So this can be compared, for example, uh, precisely to the Planck uh, 35 diagrams, the Planck collaboration diagrams. And you see that qualitatively they look similar. Again, all of this needs to be quantified in a statistical sense and with good uh, indicators so that uh, the similarity can be done better than just by eye resemblance. But in any case, it's, it's quite interesting. And here's an animation of what this magnetized simulation, this is from a paper that also appeared this year, uh, how, how the filament forms, it evolves, and then it also contracts. Uh, so it suffers the same fate as the cloud. So in, within the simulation, we again see the same mechanism. We form uh, flattened regions or, uh, or filamentary regions, which then contract and collapse, even in the presence of a magnetic field. This simulation, if I don't, of course, it's magnetically supercritical, but, uh, but it's, uh, it had a, a mean magnetic field, if I remember correctly, of two microgauss. And uh, maybe in the last couple of minutes, I want to say something about the control, the evolution and control of the star formation rate. Because, of course, I haven't addressed the big problem, the big, uh, uh, the star formation conundrum. How do we keep the star formation from going crazy? And the idea, so this is again the same estimate that I mentioned. So we need to reduce the star formation rate by a factor of about 100. We haven't quite accomplished that, but, uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, that can be done. So one thing that uh, should be considered is that we, uh, well, okay, what we did was an analytical model for the evolution of the star formation rate. It plays the same game as most of the, of the models for the star formation rate uh, uh, do, which is take the, uh, the density PDF, the probability distribution of uh, the density field, in a turbulent flow, which is uh, no, known to be a log normal before gravity acts. And then what they do is uh, they consider the mass at high densities, at sufficiently high densities that you can consider that the collapse is instantaneous compared to the time scales for the cloud evolution. 
and divide that by a suitable collapse time scale, and that gives you an estimate for the star formation rate. So you see immediately that this leads to a smaller star formation rate than the global collapse, because that assumes that this whole thing is collapsing on its threefold time scale, but this is collapsing just a fraction of the mass on the cloud on a different time scale. The important thing is that this, has this, this material, being at high densities, has shorter freefall times than the mean cloud. So like I said, it collapses earlier. And, but what we did is, assuming that the cloud is collapsing as, as a whole, uh, then what, we just did the simplest possible thing to do, which is allow the density PDF to, to move, to shift to higher densities as it collapsed. So we followed in uh, analytically the collapse of a sheet-like cloud, which by the way is shorter, it, it's longer than, than a spherical cloud, and, uh, but let it ad advance to higher densities. That means that the mass fraction at high densities is, uh, is increasing with time. So the immediate implication of this is that the star formation rate must increase with time. Then we just computed an IMF to get a, from, so, now we have the star formation rate, so from there we compute an I, we use an IMF to compute the number of massive stars. From there we compute the evaporation rate of the cloud, and uh, we have a model, an analytical model, semi-analytical, for the evolution of, very, of all the cloud parameters, the cloud mass, the star formation rate, the efficiency, the radius, and so on. And let me go directly to, to this. So we could plot so the main controlling parameter of this model is just the cloud mass. So here's the evolution of a cloud of 2,000 solar masses in the kennicott schmidt diagram, which is uh, the surface density of star formation rate uh, versus the surface density of gas. And you see that its evolution goes uh, by the locus of uh, low mass star, star forming clouds. So it starts down here when it's doing nothing, so it's not, not forming stars. Then it evolves, its star formation rate increases, and its column density increases because it's, it's contracting. So it goes by the locus of low mass star forming clouds. Then it keeps evolving, and a few million years later, it goes by the, uh, th uh, near the locus of objects like star, uh, massive star forming clumps, like the Orion molecular cloud one, and uh, it ends with a burst here. So, and then the line disappears because the, the cloud evolves extremely rapidly here and with just a burst, and then the stars destroy the whole cloud. Uh, and we've done several other tests, uh, just trying to match other, other observational constraints, and so far, uh, the model seems to be doing well. This is just a very quick uh, comment on um, a, the latest paper we have produced uh, with this model, where we use the model to predict the star formation efficiencies of clouds of a given mass. And this was based on a sample of clouds that Charlie Lada uh, and colleagues published in 2010, where they gave us enough parameters for the clouds that we could constrain the our model both in time and in mass. And so with that, we could say, okay, this is a model that should match the cloud. What is the predicted star formation efficiency? And we compare that to the observed and to order of magnitude, we, we see a trend. Of course, it's far from perfect, but for a model that is just considering gravitational collapse and ultraviolet photoionizing radiation, uh, I think it's capturing uh, uh, interesting things. The most interesting thing from this is that then this tells us that clouds that have similar masses but very different uh, star formation efficiencies can be interpreted as being at different evolutionary stages. So a cloud that has a high efficiency uh, than another cloud with, with similar mass, but, uh, and the other cloud has a lower star formation efficiency, we interpret that as meaning that the low uh, efficiency cloud is a much younger cloud. And this is uh, actually from a semi-analytical model. So I don't have time to keep going, so I'm gonna have to skip all this and just give you uh, the, the conclusions. Um, so in this scenario of hierarchical gravitational fragmentation, the main idea is this works for solar neighborhood, neighborhood type of conditions. We still need to work out uh, what happens in, for example, fully molecular environments. But for uh, solar neighborhood type of conditions where most of the gas is atomic, uh, 
then phase transitions from the warm to the cold uh, uh, phase imply that the genes mass drops precipitously and we expect the clouds to begin to collapse. This collapse should be multi-scale thanks to the presence of turbulence, which gives us a distribution of freefall times inside the cloud. Uh, the massive star forming regions consist of mergers of low mass regions. The star formation first accelerates and then I didn't have much time to discuss, but then decreases due to feedback. And so instead of turbulence being supporting the clouds at all times and giving us a stationary, quasi stationary state for the clouds, we imagine the clouds instead of going into collapse stages uh, because the initial, the primordial turbulence is insufficient to prevent collapse and then undergoing a burst of star formation where now the induced turbulence overwhelms the gravity and blows the cloud apart and then later on it collects again and undergoes another cycle. And so that's the perspective. And with that, I finish and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thank Two you. things to think about there. <laughs> yeah, thank so, you. Yeah. Where did the angular momentum arguments go? Uh, it's very interesting. The one thing that we investigated early in my career is what a what is the fate of vortical modes in the turbulence uh, for fluids with different, uh, with different equations of state. When, when the fluid in particular is uh, very highly compressible, so when it cools very efficiently, more than isothermally, so for example, thermal instability is, is, is an extremely efficiently cooling gas. No? When that happens, your vortical modes tend to disappear. It, it's very interesting. So really there is not much feeding of the vorticity until you hit the very smallest scales. So we've seen rotating objects, but only at this, well, mostly, only at the scale of the central cores that form where two filaments collide. Uh, we've also done simulations of, for example, streams colliding at an angle so that there's some shear generated, but um, the story is essentially the same, it just takes longer and perhaps less gas participates in, in the process because some of the gas is just sheared apart and just goes away. But the gas that collapses then goes the same way. So for example, with our analytical model, it would just be modeled with a lower total <coughs> mass going into the collapse. But it's very interesting. Uh, the, the, in that paper, it goes back to 1996, we, we were like absolute turbulence fans and we were so concerned about saving vorticity, you know? It's like, how, how can we save vorticity? Because it, it was disappearing. And the conclusion was, you need magnetic fields or Coriolis forces or something else. But if you just have a hydrodynamical flow subject to strong cooling, your vertical modes go down the drain. Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you have an ex explanation for why uh, such a large fraction of the molecular material in the galaxy is in massive clouds around 10 to the 5 solar masses? Um, no, you mean something like to try to explain the cloud mass spectrum? Yes. No, we, we, our model hasn't got to that point yet. No, here we're, for me, the cloud mass spectrum is just like an input parameter. You know? For example, in one of the slides that I didn't have time to discuss much, what we did is we took our analytical model, and uh, so like because the, part, the main parameter is the total mass of the of the cloud, so we convo convolved the evolution of one model with a cloud mass spectrum uh, to obtain a uh, model galaxy, and uh, and it worked quite well. So it gave us uh, a star in in the Kennicott Schmidt diagram, so star formation rate versus mass, or the a similar version, you know, an equivalent version of it, star formation rate versus mass. Um, it gave us a reasonable looking galaxy. But so for me, the mass spec the cloud mass spectrum is just an input parameter. I have no explanation for what would cause the preference for clouds of galaxies. Might be a good clue because it seems like uh, in regions that are very different from the, the solar neighborhood, mm -hmm. the cloud mass spectrum is still approximately the same, even though the clouds themselves in regions where the tidal forces may be large, for example, mm -hmm. in the center of the galaxy, uh, the clouds are, are much denser on average 
intergas intercloud material is molecular. So uh, right. the, the cloud mass spectrum seems to be more constant than a lot of other things. <coughs> yeah. In the uh, environment. Sort of like the IMF. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, unfortunately, we, uh, our model cannot say anything about that. Perhaps, um, perhaps taking into account larger scale uh, agents uh, that would, because here we're just assuming that there's some flow that produces a cloud, but we have not discussed that. So perhaps now that you mention it, perhaps we could take like the uh, kinetic energy, the energy spectrum of the turbulence at the large scales, and see if that gives us something. I, I don't know that, that was really, but how? No, no. Our model gives no answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> So when you have supersonic motions and gases, mm -hmm. generally you have some formation of shocks, mm -hmm. shock-heated gas. Mm -hmm. Is that shock-heated gas observed? Actually, um, well, what's interesting is that the cooling times, especially in the dense <coughs> gas, are so short that for all practical purposes you don't see the shock-heated gas. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at the large scales, when we first form the, the clouds, Actually, in one of our first papers on, on cloud formation, what we did is we worked out the jump conditions for, for the gas. And so there are two, shock, two jumps. One is a shock jump, uh, so that's truly a shock. Uh, but it's propagating into the warm neutral medium, so nobody cares about it, nobody looks at it. Uh, and so there's a shock front uh, propagating back into the, in the, into the colliding stream. But because it's just happening in the warm diffuse medium, it's almost unobservable. And what, what's really observable is the condensation front. So one cooling length behind the shock. So that shock plays a role of heating up the gas and throwing it out of thermal equilibrium. And so now the gas is evolving out of thermal equilibrium. And when it comes back to equilibrium, it often comes back to the cold phase instead of the warm phase. So that's what triggers the jump to the cold phase. And, uh, and then what you observe is when that happens, you observe the phase transition jump. Uh, so you see a density jump, and, uh, but it's actually not a shock. We, we checked and it's not a shock. It's subsonic throughout. And, and, and there is a shock, but it's almost unobservable out, out there in the warm neutral medium. And when it's led by gravity, then there's very little shock formation because you saw that the, the filaments grow, but at the same time, the mass of, uh, of the clumps grows. Everything is accreting. At the beginning, it's just growing in mass. It's like uh, like a pre-stellar contraction stage, so it's not there's no shock at the center. And before in the filaments, before you can develop a shock, the flow gets <coughs> dragged in by the potential well of the clump, and so there's this smooth transition, change of direction of the flow. Uh, I like to think of it as rivers in, in, in the ISM, uh, and so there's almost no shock. So that's one of the things I tell to filament modelers that in our simulation we see almost no shocks in the insides of the filaments. And uh, so the most, uh, the, the main material that it is shocked is a warm neut neutral medium outside of the cloud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like, as I told you earlier, I really like the uh, gravitational mm -hmm. point of view that you're taking on collapse, and I think mm -hmm. it has potential to explain a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I want to make a comment about your initial motivations to doing this, and mm -hmm. in particular about Larson's relation between mass and size that give you constant columns. Mm -hmm. When we use extinction and dust rather than CO, we find for local clouds that that relationship holds to 10% mm -hmm. across a wide range of masses. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the uh, difficulty of doing this beyond the local region using molecular lines, uh, you can go and look at other galaxies, for example, if you look at uh, Adam Leroy or Frank Bugel's um, surveys of uh, nearby disk galaxies. Mm -hmm. You see that they all seem to have constant column densities in the disk that are surprisingly close to what we find in the Milky Way, about 40 to 50 mm -hmm. solar masses per square parsec. And so um, also the extinction, when we make that plot, there's absolutely no uh, concern that you raised before about it being due to a selection effect due to the observation sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So when you use extinction, those selection effects go away. Mm -hmm. So those um, relationships seem to hold. And what uh, a, a student of mine found who uh, looked at nearby galaxies with Alma, Chris Fazy, mm -hmm. 
last year in the stasis was that, in fact, you can get the mean column density of clouds to change in a galaxy or between galaxies by exchange, uh, uh, um, having them uh, be in regions where the external pressure uh, changes. Mm -hmm. So in regions where you have high external pressure, you tend to get higher column densities, but they're still constant. Mm -hmm. So the last of relations, we think, <coughs> really do hold. Yeah. Uh that is something that uh, I would like also to, to discuss with you a little bit more. There's, um, then there is, to my, my feeling about that, but it's just my feeling, that's why we need to check, is that there what matters is mostly the way in which the clouds are defined. So the range of, of uh, well, the tracer that you're using and so on and so forth. It's like, for example, the Herschel filaments, they seem to have this universal, uh, central width, but there's always the concern that it may be the fact that it's Herschel filaments. No? So here, uh, if, if the clouds are being defined in some way, uh, that might select somehow the, the range. Right, and I think, uh -huh. I exactly agree with you. So what we've been trying to do is mm -hmm. do this in the galaxy, in the external galaxies in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. When we do that, we get self-consistent results. So for example, you look at hires, work. He defines clouds very differently than we do. Uh -huh. By taking peaks, you know, they have to deconvolve uh, massive clouds. They look at peaks and they take that full width at half maximum. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that if you have temperature okay. variations, mm -hmm. that's not going to give you a similar kind of size and column density mm -hmm. if you don't go to some, say, fixed column density boundary. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the spread you see in those diagrams locally mm -hmm. are due to exactly what you're saying, due mm -hmm. to the way People, um, the way the clouds are defined. Right. Yeah. But you can define them in a self-consistent way, and when you do that, mm -hmm. you find that Larson's relations hold up pretty well. Yeah, that's that's something that I, I, I've really been wanting to to understand. So, so yes, it's a good topic to, to talk about. Yeah, there's this result that if you define somehow a class of objects that is uh, that has density peaks, uh, where the peaks are collapsing. Uh, what's interesting is that, nevertheless, most of the masses are the lowest densities. And so the, uh, the mean column density that you find uh, is not too far from whatever column density was used to define uh, the object. So, uh, and, and so that's a paper by Javier Ballesteros and Lee Hartman. And, uh, and so that might also be playing a role. So if, on the one hand, you're defining the clouds in, uh, with one procedure, that somehow sets uh, a, a threshold for defining the objects, then the amount of mass that you have at much higher column densities is so little that your mean column density is not too far from that. But so. That's exactly right. Okay. Uh, and then I have just a question on the theory. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in your theory, you have uh, PDFs that are log normal, and then you show this really nice graph where if mm -hmm. you increase the peak mm -hmm. of the PDF, mm -hmm. uh, then the amount that's at high density yeah. increases. But you know, we find observation that the PDFs are actually power laws, yeah. and that it's the slope of the power law that changes rather than the peak of the mean. Totally agree. Yeah. So I wonder how that would affect. Well, we have our explanation for that. Uh -huh. uh, I sort of got myself convinced that it's true, <laughs> uh, uh, but but no, there's there's some deep things to think about there. It, it's you can consider that the density PDF. So there's numerical works that have shown that the density, this was by Kritzuk and collaborators in 2011, that the density PDF, uh, the power law slope of the density PDF may be due to the development of local collapsing sites that themselves have power law density, radial density profiles. So if you map those density profiles into a density PDF, then you get a power law. So if... Uh, if that's a mechanism, so what we have in mind is that you can imagine that you uh, separate the contribution of turbulence from the contribution of gravity. And so since here we're interested in what turbulent density fluctuations will be captured by gravity and driven to collapse, so we should start from the, from the PDF of the turbulence, not the PDF that is already affected by gravity. So that's our explanation. And, well, and, and I'm willing to take. Uh, uh, once your PDF gets work. to such high mm -hmm. densities, mm -hmm. uh, it was inconsistent with observations because it's no longer log normal. 
Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. The PDF that I'm assuming here is not the total PDF, it's just the contribution to the PDF from the turbulence. The other part, the, the power law part, we're assuming that comes from gravitational contraction. So it's like this PDF is just sort of like the effect of turbulence. That's the way we justified it, and the referee bought it. <laughs> but I, I, I agree that there's uh, room to discussion there. Okay, well, unfortunately, we do not have room for further discussion. <laughs> so let's thank Enrique again. Thank you.